Today we talked about the first two layers of the OSI model and what we were doing is detailing out um, what was the hardware that functions at that layer, which is dictated by what kind of addressing functions at that layer. So that means that hardware is concerned with that addressing. And then when you take that addressing and add it to data as it moves along the layers, what is that unit of data now called with that addressing and error checking information and the other things that get added as we move along the way. In the first block, we had the physical layer. Mm -hmm. Devices in the physical layer don't have any addressing, but the way that they communicate is that they broadcast. Kind of like television, they just shoot the stuff out and if you're there to hear it, you're there to hear it, but everybody can hear it. So there is no one-on-one -on -one communication, it's one to everyone. So the PDU of this layer is called the bit or also known as binary transmission. That means the devices at this layer don't care about anything that's inside the data. They don't care about the protocol that's in use. They don't care about anything. All they know is that when a bit comes in, that same get bit gets put out. These bits are represented by electricity. There is electricity or there's not electricity. Uh, this is your electricity applied to a wire. That is our definition of binary transmission. It's representing a one energy. Now the hardware that, are, that broadcasts or are concerned with bits, they tend to extend cable distances to defeat attenuation. Attenuation is the friction caused uh, when electricity tries to go down a wire. And they regenerate the signal and clean it up. We like to say regenerate and not amplify because if there was noise on the line, it would amplify the noise too. So what we like to say is that it regenerates, meaning we get back to what the original signal is and we clean it up so that there is no noise. Devices that do this are the repeater. Repeaters are most often found in the WAN, the wide area network, or outside, top of telephone poles or underground. Um, the wide area network repeater is a one in, one out box, and it is extending cable distances usually at two kilometers or a little less or a little more. But it's the kinds of things that connect cities and towns together, or long strands of larger internet service providers. Now, a box full of repeaters is often found inside, in your network. This is called a hub. Um, our local area networks are not really using hubs anymore because of the fact that they broadcast, meaning that everyone in the network will hear our traffic, and that can cause a lot of collisions. So to alleviate that issue, we've moved on to some other things we'll talk about in a second. A hub connects multiple devices on a computer network, and this is an old-style piece of hardware. Now, it can be useful because of the fact that it broadcasts. You can stick a hub in your network. If you stick it in the beginning of the network or between the network segment, what will happen is, is any information that comes in that hub from one direction or the other, you can hook up a computer to that hub, and all the information that comes in or out of that hub will then be broadcasted to that cable that that computer is on. And you can use some special software called a packet sniffer or protocol analyzer. And uh, we're going to look at a couple of those, one called Wireshark and one called CAPSA. Um, these are free, and it allows you to look at the protocol information that the, uh, the data is carrying. We, I try not to say packets or frames at this time because that's what we're learning as we go along. But... Everybody in networking refers to the data as it goes by as a packet because it does get packaged up as a packet. But when it, we move along into other areas, it'll tear that packet apart and only look at the parts it cares about, those particular pieces. All right, so the data link layer is the second layer of the OSI model. The addressing here is called the MAC address. This is a hexadecimal number burned into a chip on the NIC card, our network interface card. Um, when we take a piece of data, data is uh, chopped up into millions of pieces, and then the information is added to that one piece and sent down the wire. All of these little pieces are then reassembled on the other end to get you your picture or your song or your movie, whatever you're trying to move along there. These MAC addresses or hexadecimal numbers burn into a chip on the NIC card. When we take that source MAC address of who's sending the information, the destination MAC address, who's going to receive this information, and we encapsulate that around what we call the payload, or which is just the piece of data that we're working with at that time. 
We also want to make sure that we have a frame check sequence. This is kind of like numbering the pieces of a puzzle so that you can put it back together quickly. Um, the computer doesn't want to spend time having fun putting a puzzle together. It wants to put it together quickly so they can then present you whatever the data was that you were trying to receive. Also, each piece of the puzzle needs to be made sure that it's correct. So um, if there's too much data, it's corrupt. If there's too little data, it's corrupt. It'll request retransmission once it determines that. It's really just a mathematical equation where you take data and two computers agree on a particular number and you get an answer. So when you send it to the other side, it takes data, takes the number you've agreed on, and then it should come to an answer that, that's the same on both ends. Most likely the data will then be correct. This is called the cyclic redundancy check, or CRC. So when we take a piece of data, or the payload, and we add the source and destination MAC address, encapsulate with a frame check sequence in the cyclic redundancy check, FCS and CRC, all of these are the definition for what does data look like at this layer, and that's called a frame. Now the hardware that's, that's concerned with looking at frames or keeping tables of MAC addresses or offer MAC addresses as addressing are the network interface card, so that's one device that functions at the data link layer, uh, a bridge which forwards or discards frames based on destination MAC address. So it just segments the network into pieces. So it can either be on this side of the network or that side of the network. Um, it still broadcasts to those segments, but at least we can chop those network pieces up into smaller parts. We also have the switch, which replaced our hub. Um, so it also connects multiple computers on the network, the switch. But what it does is it uses virtual circuits or, you know, we said the old um, switchboard operator and she, you would call her and she will plug in a wire to you and then whoever you wanted to call, she would plug in a wire creating a circuit. Well, now we just use a virtual circuit. We got rid of her and uh, stuck her in the box. And these virtual circuits are used to create what we call collision domains or the space of a network where collision can happen. So creating a collision domain that's much smaller than the whole network, like broadcasters would have done, this allows for better communication and more reliable communication and a whole lot less collisions. Now the data link layer itself is broken up into two main parts. Those two main parts are known as the media access control, which really means to control access to the cable. And media means cable in this case. In wireless it means air. It's just how do we exchange information either by the cable or through the air. <coughs> and in this case, the media access control is the long name for the media access control address, or that number that's burned into a chip on the NIC card. But since it's a number burned into a chip on the NIC card, we need a way to share this. So in order to share it, we have a piece of software. It's called the logic link control. It allows us to control the link to the software, because logic means software. So does virtual most of the time. So that brings us to our next layer, the network layer. Now just as we said that in the devices, a repeater extends network distances, and I said, well, a hub also extends network distances. Bridges can extend network distances because they also have the ability to extend cable distances by regenerating the signal or cleaning up the signal and sending it on, and a switch can do the same thing. So your unshielded twisted pair, your UTPs, it only lasts 100 meters before the signal is too degraded so much that it doesn't receive well on the other end. What we can do is throw in a switch now instead of hubs like in the old days, and this of course will allow you to then use another cable and continue on if you need it to. They do make smaller devices if you're just trying to run a one-to-one -one cable to extend it out. But most of the time what you'll find is the distance between one switch and the next switch is going to fall within the 100 meters. We don't tend to have rooms being so far apart that that won't work, that won't work for us. <coughs> so the network layer, that means that any device that functions this layer also is going to regenerate and extend cable distances. It's going to keep a table that has MAC addresses in it, but it's also going to keep more information now because
because we have some addressing at this layer too. So we're going to be looking for what is the addressing at this layer. And I'm actually going to move this up. Now how much do you know about IP addresses? IP? Mm-hmm. Would you like the long version or the short version of IP addresses? <laughs> now we're not going to make you do anything with them. It'll just determine on how long I have to talk about them. I know. Right, so we have, uh, in, in our local area networks and our wide area networks, not counting research, development in the government and stuff like that, how many classes of IP addresses do we have? It is three. It is three. Um, and do you know why it's only three? Do you know why we can't use the fourth at all? Uh, it's actually going to be apparent when we look at how the first three IP addresses are arranged with another number I called... Think, I think it's another one, but I can't think of it. There's actually five, but um, like I said, as soon as we see how IP addresses are formed and then the subnet mask that goes with them, once we learn what a subnet mask does, then we can figure out why we don't use uh, D and E, class D and E. Uh, so subnet masks, what do you know about a subnet mask? you know a quick way to discuss a subnet mask? No. Nope. So then we're going to take the long route to learn about IP addresses. <laughs> do you remember what numbers, how do you know if uh, an IP address is a class A IP address? They got a certain range. That's right, a certain range. And do you happen to remember what class A's range is? No, I don't know. All right. Then we are definitely going to do the long version. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky for the camera. All right, so basically class A, um, now, let, let, the first thing I want to do is make sure we understand this. This is not set in stone. What really determines whether this is class A, B, or C is the subnet mask. But until you make a change to the subnet mask, there is a default class range and a default subnet mask for a range of numbers. Right. So as long as you don't make any changes to it, this is true, everything I'm about to say. So if the number falls between 0 and 126, it's said to be class A. But what is an IP address, and how do I know which number needs to be 0 through 126? Well, I'm going to use some X's. An IP address is basically four numbers separated by periods. And these numbers range from 0 to 255. The way that we get these numbers is that each one of these sections between the periods, it's called an octet. And the reason it's called an octet is because what it really is is a set of binary numbers, eight of them, which is how we get the term oct for octagon. Zero, 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 zero. Now this is an eight-digit number, binary number, that represents the number zero. And really, you don't even have to use these seven because it's zero. But to understand IP addresses, we're always going to work with 8. So even when we show 0, we just want to show all 8. Now, this is that binary transmission that we were talking about. This is a representation of two numbers, either 0 or 1. When it's a 0, it's turned off. When it's a 1, that place value is turned on. The place values for these numbers are 1, 2, 4, 8. 16, 32, 64, and 128. So for instance, if I wanted to show the number 3, I would have to turn on the number 1 and the number 2. And then the rest of these would be zeros. Now many times in computers you'll find that they again will not show these numbers and say if this is a binary number, what is that number? But in our case, we're always going to show 8 because we're trying to remember these are called octets. Mm -hmm. Now, this is known as what we call a 32-bit addressing. One of these zeros is a bit, and if there's four sections of them, of 8 each, 8 times 4 is 32. So there's 32 of these ones or zeros, bits, 32 bits. 
So when you hear the term 32-bit addressing or 48-bit addressing or 128-bit addressing or 24-bit processing, any of these terms just tells you how many ones and zeros are they chaining together to get a number value. If you don't have them separated by a period, the numbers just continue to double because it's secretly just the powers of 2. 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, those exponents that we heard about back in math class. So 2 to the 7 is basically just 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is 128. So any value and arrangement of these would give us a number. So if we were to take, and I don't want to know the answer, I just want to know that we understand how to do the mathematical formula. If I were to show a binary number of 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, what is the mathematical problem that we're actually trying to do? So which, we're trying to add 128, we're trying to add 64, we're trying to add 2, and we're trying to add 1. So 128 plus 64 is 192? <laughs> Yeah, 6, 8, 4, 2 is 12. 92. So it's 192, and then plus 2 is 194, and plus 1 is 195. So this number would have been 195. So in order to understand what class an IP address is, the first clue is what is the first number? So if the first number is 0 to 126, there's a good chance that this is a class A network. Now I say a good chance, that means there's something else that goes with this. And in order for this to truly be a class A network, we have to be able to look at the subnet mask. The subnet mask is a number that tells you something about the IP address that you're working with. What it tells you is, is which part of this IP address identifies the network, meaning groups of computers? And which part of this IP address represents the host or an actual computer that's on that network? <coughs> so the subnet masks for class A, if it's in its default mode, meaning I didn't make any changes to it, it is actually 255.0.0.0. And what this is telling me about our IP address is that the first number identifies a network address. This number would look like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, dot, nothing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we're saying that all the bits in this octet have been used up to represent the network portion of this IP address that I don't have written up here yet. So let's actually just make up an IP address right now. I'm going to make up 69.133.14.2. If the subnet mask is 255.0.0.0, what we're saying is, is that 69 is the network portion of this number. The rest of these are the host portion of this number. That means it identifies a specific computer. So let's see if you loosely understand what I'm trying to say. And we're going to do that by comparing two IP addresses. If I have an IP address on one computer of 69.133.15.6, and I have one that's 69.133.15.7. Are these two numbers in the same network if they have this subnet mask? You can say that, yes. Yes, because this says that all of the bits in the first octet have been used up to make a network. <coughs> How do I know? Because it's 255, and that's the biggest number you can represent. So if it's used up to be the network address, then that means if this number changes, it's in a different network. So when we look at our two IP addresses, they both start with 69, so they are both in the same network. None of these numbers over here matter because they all identify a specific computer. Now, how about 
71.133.15.6 are these two numbers in the same network? Yes. But no, they are not. And that is because if they have this subnet mask, it's the first yeah, number that must be yeah. exactly the same. If this number changes, then they are not in the same yeah. network. And so the first one it's is okay, it was a trick question. Yeah, the first 69 and 71 are two different numbers, and this says that they have to be the same. The host portion is the same, yeah. 133, 15, 66, and all this means is this is a computer on this network, mm -hmm. and this is a computer on this network. They just happen to have yeah, the, the same, same host portion. Which means nothing. But they, you really wouldn't see that, though, would you? Yes, you could. Somewhere in the world, some computer and some network is identified at 69.133.15.6. And somewhere in the world, some computer or network is identified with 71.133.15.6. And somewhere in the world, both of those IP addresses have this default subnet mask. The, I don't the know host, where. the host name. Um, that's the computer itself. The host identifies a specific computer so, on the network. But two computers are not going to have the same host name, though. They can have the same host numbers if the network number is different. This is how that works. If I live at Crown Lake Apartments and my address is 1310 Oakcrest Drive, and you live at Windsor Lake Apartments and your address is 1355 Oakcrest Drive, but, we can both live in apartment 1233 because I live at Crown Lake and you live at Windsor Shores, right? But they don't, you're going to get a lot of the information off your net card. No, you huh? won't. They are in two different networks. This might be in China. This might be in Arizona. The network portion identifies what network they are on. It has nothing to do with the host portion until you get there. Think of this. The mailman has that letter for you and a letter for me. They have a letter for you and a letter for me. We both live in apartment 1233. Is my letter going to go to your apartment complex? The address of the apartment complexes are different. Right. But we both live, you live at Windsor Lake, I live at Crown Lake. Right. Is my mail going to go to your house? Because we both live in apartment 1233, but we both don't live in the same apartment complex. So this number, being all used up to represent networks, is identifying a whole a different apartment complex. <laughs> Host values identify specific apartments within that complex. So in my apartment complex, I live in apartment 1233. In your apartment complex, you live in apartment 1233. Okay. But I live in Windsor Lake, and you live in Crown Lake. We live in two different apartment complexes. Okay. So you will never get my mail unless the mailman is failing to do his job. We're lazy, just gonna throw some mail out there. But as long as we deliver to the right apartment complex, you will never hear or see my traffic. This will make a little more sense when we do a couple more. <coughs> now class B, starts at 128, and goes to 191. Now you'll notice that I skipped over a number. It's because that number, 127, has a special job, right. and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So class B starts at 128 to 191. So what that means is if this first number is 128 to 191, it might be a class B network. The way that we'll know if it's a class B network is if it has a subnet mask of 255.255.0.0. What this means is the first two numbers identify the network address and the second two numbers identify a specific computer or a host computer. So, if 120.15.60.3 is on a network with 120.16.60.4, are these two IP addresses in the same network? 
To identify this, wherever the ends are, they no. need to be the no. same. No. That's right. They are not the same. So these are two different networks, two computers on two different networks. But if we had a computer of 120.15.61.4, are these two computers on the same network? Yes. Yes, they are. Because the first two numbers are the same. That's all we care about. Wherever the two five fives are, it means if that number changes, then it's in a different network. It does not matter about the host portion. This only lets us know that if these numbers are different, it's just two different computers. Can I ask you something? Sure. Why did the, um, the host name, you go to two instead of one in the classes? Class A allows us to take 256 times 256 times 256 numbers to give us about 16.7 million computers okay. per network. Right. Class A networks are generally used for the government, giant, right. universities, and stuff like that. So then they gave us Class B networks, which would give us... 256 times 256, which is about 65,700 computers. So usually, Class B, usually the first two octates are the same. They're not necessarily the same, but the first two identify the network portion. Okay. If the subnet mask is 255, 255. Okay. These two numbers are important together. And let me show you an example first of how you might see those together. All right, so we have something that we use in our computer called the command prompt. This command prompt is a little black screen that we go to that allows you to type in some commands and get some information or make some changes to your computer. One of them that we can use is called ipconfig, I-P-C-O-N-F-I-G. This allows you to see your IP address, who the default gateway is, what's the last router on your way out to the internet most of the time. And it also allows you to see what your subnet mask is. And a subnet mask tells you how is my network logically divided or organized. If you have a default subnet mask, Meaning, if you have a class A and it is a class A subnet mask, mm -hmm. then your network is not divided. It's one big network with a whole bunch of computers on it. If you had a class B, it means that you have 256 times 256 networks available with 256 times 256 computers available. Now, any one network is only going to have the one network number. So when you were to see an IP address, let's say, for instance... Um, 170.16.33.12. This doesn't tell you anything by itself. You can only guess that it might be a class B. You have to have a subnet mask with it. Now you have a subnet mask that goes with it. So if you assign an IP address to a computer, or if you looking at the IP address of a computer, you need to know what the subnet mask is if you want to know how that network has been organized. Now, this number is 170. Does it fall in the range of class B? 170? Yes. Yes. Yes, it does. And its subnet mask is 255.255.0.0. Is that the default subnet mask for a class B? Yes. Yes. So what this is telling us is that this is the network portion, this is the network portion, this is the host portion, and this is the host portion. So it's identified to us that we have this much network and this many computers. This number identifies a particular computer. So it tells us two things. One, we know that this network has not been divided up, but it does have the ability to represent 256 times 256 computers. This section identifies a particular computer. On the network of 170.16, we are identifying the computer that's 33.12. Okay. Any one computer will have one IP address. Okay. It's just a way, it's like my name is. You have to have a 
subnet mask with your IP address. It tells you how your network is logically organized. Okay. This will come clearer as we work more with IP addresses. Okay. We also have 192 until 224. This is the class C. The default subnet mask for a class C is 255.255.255.0. So what is the network portion in this class C IP address based on what we've been looking at so far? first three. That's right, the first, first three. three. So what that means is if the first three numbers are not the same, then they are not in the same network. Right. The last number is identifying the computer. So how many computers can be on a Class C network? Ooh. 255 times 255 times. Hosts are computers. So how many computers can be on this network? Zero. It's well, saying zero. that's saying how many bits have been used up. Remember, well, okay. if we use up all the oh, bits, it represents the network, and if we don't, it uses up, doesn't use up any of the bits, then that's how many computers can be available. So yes, 256, let's not forget, zero is a number. Right. In the case of computers, zero can be assigned. Right. Now, to understand why we don't use Class D and Class E, I'm not going to get into Class E because as soon as I show you what happens with Class D, you'll understand why we don't use them. <laughs> <laughs> now, the range for Class D kind of fluctuates over time. So when I went to school, the range was at 225 uh, until, uh, let's see, 225 and 32. <laughs> it's too much. So basically, it was 225 until, I think it's 8. Anyway, it doesn't really matter because you're not going to have to worry about it. This is for research development and the government. But a Class D, a Class D, a Class D subnet mask would be 255.255.255.255. That means that all the bits have been used up to represent a network, a network, a network, and a network. Is there any room to identify a single computer with this class? No. No. So if you can't have a computer on your network, is it any use to you? No. So in this case, all that this does is identify a group of computers. It allows it to identify a specific network. And they do this, uh, like I said, research and development and in the government. And um, that doesn't really help us as network administrators. So if you want to learn more about that, you can. But I don't think there's too much more to learn unless you actually get one of those jobs um, to identify a network of computers. What the addressing becomes for the individual computers in that network, I don't think there is any. I think that uh, those numbers then become subnetted on the other side of that network address in some other way. But even I'm not sure because I've never had to deal with this Class D network address. Right. Um, so we also noticed that there's some numbers missing. So we're going to go ahead and put those numbers in. And I said the number 127 was missing because 127.0.0.1 it has a special job. Do you remember this job? Is that the one where you, that's the one what you use for working on computers, or basically ping, a loop back or whatever. There you go, that's right. Uh, you use the ping command to test your loop back address. What that means is you're just testing your own NIC card to make sure that IP is running correctly on your, so you would go ping space, 127.0.0.1 and press enter. It would then ping your NIC card and then give you a reply to let you know that IP is working on your NIC card. 
Now we have um, another special group of numbers right in here. And uh, let's see, what's the good color? <laughs> All right, so these numbers that I have detailed out here right now are usually 99.9999% of the time are found on the wide area network. The ones, all those right here. All these right here. Okay. These are known as public IP addresses. And if you want a way to, to, to arrange that in your mind, think of it like this. You know where the wide area network is, right? Um, outside? It's area. outside, that's right. And outside is where the public is, right? right? Now, if I'm using an IP address inside of my house, is that a public place for you to be? Inside my house? Do we put up signs that says no. public property inside your house? No. No, what's the word we use when you say you're inside your house and you shouldn't be in my house because this is what kind of property? Private. Private. And this is what kind of IP address the other numbers are. So the private IP addresses or the IP addresses that we use inside your local area network are called private IP addresses. And the range, there's a range for each one of these classes. Now I say range because that means that you can have more than one computer address. Okay. So the class A is 10.0.0.0 until you reach 10.255.255.255. Now this helps us understand IP addresses a little better. Notice how the first number didn't change? That's one network address. And in class A, that means you could have 256 times 256 times 256 computers. The first number would be 000, zero until the last number. If it's like a clock. When it's 159 and you add one more minute, what time is it? One more minute. 159. Add a minute. Six. One, oh, I mean two. Yeah, that's right. It's two o'clock. God, killing my video. Uh, <laughs> two o'clock. So this is the same thing. If I were to add a number, 10.255.255.255, it's kind of like a clock. It rolls over. So what is the next network address after 10.255.255.255? Yes, there it is. Oh, okay, 11. Okay. Yeah, right, it rolls over just like a clock. So 159 and you add a minute, it becomes two so o'clock. So it, this is not a public IP address. This, I mean, this is not a private IP address right here. It's a public IP address. So anything that's bigger than this or not inside this range, if it's not between 10.0000 and 10.255.255.255, then it's going to be either lower than that, meaning 9 dot something, 8 dot something, 7 dot something, that's a public IP address. And if you add one more to 255, 255, 255, when your network is 10, it goes up to 11, that is still class A. It's just a public IP address. So this is the range for private IP addresses or the IP addresses that you can use in your local area network, inside your home or inside your business. It won't be found outside. No. For okay. instance, okay, for instance, I see what you're saying. Right, I, 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 this I, computer right here, this computer is 10.13.13.121. This computer is 10.13.13.13. This computer right here is 10.13.13.128. This computer right here is 10.13.13.5. I only know that because I, I monitor the traffic for this network, so I know which computer is which. So, this is the range that you can use to so, either assign or have automatically assigned IP addresses for computers in your network. So in other words, they, they went into the public and took a set of IP addresses and made them private. 
That's right. And okay. reserved them for being inside your house. Okay. Good. I'm glad you got okay. that. Right. That's why I, I was looking at the range and stuff. And, and it, That's why I even chose a different color. Right. And I should write right next to it so you know. Private. And it's most often found in the local area network. So now we have a lot of class A's that we can assign out into the world to identify your house, but then we also have some private IP addresses that we can use to identify the computers only inside. Because when we get to your house, there's a router there. That's like the apartment complex address. Mm -hmm. But is there only one person living in the apartment complex? Nope. So the street address might be 1310 Oak Crest Drive, but inside the apartment complex, isn't there an apartment that might be 1310? Mm -hmm. But there's also an apartment that's 1311, and the apartment number has nothing to do with the street address, does it? But you know what? That's how a lot of people get busted, because they got those private IP addresses. Nope. <laughs> the reason that people get busted is because whenever traffic is inside your network, it's got its private IP address. And it's got its MAC address. Remember, at the network layer, we use the MAC address in it and the IP address in a table. So what happens is information goes around your network and says, I need to leave my network. And it heads for the router. And when it gets to the router, the router says, okay, let me take your public IP address and put that away. Oh. I'm sorry. It says, let me take your private IP address and put that away. And then puts in the public IP address. So every computer in this room, when it needs to leave and go out into the wide area network, its private IP address is taken and put away, and it gets the public IP address. Every computer in your house or in this school has the same public IP address. And we can actually take a look at that in, in a lab that we're going to do later on. I'm going to show you how to reflect your public IP address back to you so you can see it. But nobody can see your private IP address. But what is still attached to your IP address, no matter whether it's private or public? There's something still attached to your IP address. And this is how you get busted doing stuff you're not supposed to be doing. Because yeah, yeah. not only is it identifying your public IP address, which identifies your house and the router that you have, because your ISP, your internet service provider, issued you that IP address. So they know who's got that IP address. They know right which house to go to. But when they get to that house, what if you got five computers in your house? You might have any number of public, uh, sorry, you might have any number of private IP addresses. How does it identify, this is the computer that was at that place yeah, doing those things we weren't yeah. supposed to do? By the NIC. That's right, because your MAC address from your NIC card is attached to that IP address, no right. matter which one you're using. Right. It hides it, and no one is supposed to be able to look at it, but the forensics police can look at it. Yeah. <laughs> Your ISP can look at it, <coughs> and then, of course, a few of us hackers can also look at it because we know how. Did you say us hackers? Well, <laughs> I, know how to, I know how to use a protocol analyzer, so I know how to tear packets apart right. and look at the layer 3 and layer 2 information right. to get that information. <laughs> now, this is most often used when... Uh, Mr. Ford moves from one place to another, and he has to go two weeks without the internet. And his neighbors are nice enough to have wireless internet access that they forgot to put a password on. Now, this isn't completely legal, but most of the time, if I can identify my neighbors, uh, like, you know, like, uh, I see them coming and going, I've found that a lot of the times when I see them, like, oh, look, you know, that's a military dude. It's not a big problem for me to go over and knock on the door on a Saturday and be like, hey, how you doing? I'm your neighbor and I just moved in. It's going to be two weeks till I get my internet up. I see you have a wireless router. Do you mind if I borrow your internet once in a while just to check my email and look around? And most of the time, they'll go, no, man, that's no problem. Because I'll also offer to, you know, I'll put some security on that, right, on that router if you like because everybody in the neighborhood can use your internet. Mm -hmm. And they're like, really? And I go, yeah, they can. So now I kind of help them out by helping them set up a nice password on their internet so everybody's not using their internet. Because you know, uh, we got a lot of shady individuals in the neighborhoods who love to steal internet access. And uh, what they're not really stealing, but it's not legal to be on somebody else's in network without permission. And when we say stealing, 
Um, it's more about an inconvenience. If you're trying to do something on a network and you don't have, you don't pay for a lot of bandwidth, you know, your internet speed is not that fast, mm -hmm. and your neighbor's downloading movies off of your internet connection. It's going to take up, eat up everything. That's right. Even if they're paying for Netflix. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's sucking up a lot of your bandwidth. So you're like, why is my Facebook loading so slow? And it's because they're borrowing some of your bandwidth and you don't have the fast connection like you thought you had while they're busy downloading movies. All right, so we also have a private IP address for Class B. The range of this is 172.16.0.0. .0. Now remember, Class B allows for two numbers to be identifying the network address. So it also goes to 172.31.255.255. That means that while this second octet allows for 256 networks, we only arranged for 16 of them to be used for private IP addresses, so only from 16 to 31. So 172, 16.0.0 until you get to 172.31.255.255 is available for private. Private, okay. So that's local area network. Ooh, that was terrible. All And then lastly, we have the Class C. This is the one you find in your house most of the time. As a matter of fact, if you don't go inside the router or the, your uh, ISP gave you or the router that you went to the store and bought and hooked up into your network, most of the time it's going to come with 192. And yes, I know that 192 up here says it's public. But see, we have three network addresses to identify. So it's 192.168.0.0 until you get to 192.168.255.255. Now, I understand also that the third octet leaves you about 256 network addresses that you can use. So that means in your home, you have the ability to have 256 networks with 256 host addresses. Now let's not forget, we're going to learn about subnetting in the future. So when I say we have 256 host addresses, this is not exactly correct. Um, we'll learn more about what IP addresses have certain jobs. And, uh, but I just don't want to confuse you today by adding that. So that's the break bell, so we're going to go ahead and take our break for today.